All right, folks, we're gonna do things a little different today. The, uh, I got a lot of things that well, everybody's stuck at home, so they got a hold of us, and that's fine. And they got some interesting stories and questions, so I tell you, we don't mind it as long as you tell me where you're from because we've lived in a lot of places and it's always fun to hear where somebody's from. Now, if you're wanted, then don't just don't say it, then you don't go on national TV or whatever it's called. First thing is we want to send out our best to the Navajo Res. They're having hell up there, and they, of all the people in the world, they don't deserve another calamity. They've had plenty of them. And uh, my sister, she works up there, so we uh, we get kind of an inside line on what's going on, and of course our friends up there, so good luck to you, to all of you and your families. And a um, week or so ago, we lost a, a true buckaroo. That was Ray Ordway. Ray was in his 90s, and he was born and raised in California, and he buckrooed over in Nevada, and uh, pretty much always had a riding job, and he was real adamant about the buckaroo style. And uh, he grew up around spade bits and really good horsemen. His entire family, or legacy, it, it would make a great movie and or at least a book about the Ordway family and what they've done for the for the industry, but he was a cowboy, you know, a buckaroo through and through, a good person. We're sure gonna miss him because the knowledge that went with Ray, we'll never get back. Nobody was there when he was a little kid that's around. And what he saw and heard is gone. Now he told us, he, he wasn't scared to tell you anything if you asked him a question. If he didn't know, he'd say he didn't know. But the point is, is that when you lose somebody like Ray, you've lost a legacy, you've lost a big, big chunk out of our tradition so his lovely bride up Madera she got to see her the other day and she's tough and she's resilient and she'll be fine and she's uh, thankful for everybody that's checked in on her so anyway I want to tell you first thing I, I mentioned the other day I was gonna uh, share some hints with young people or people that want to get into ranching or work on an outfit and uh, today I just wanted to tell you it's pretty simple. You got you you should know how to shoe a horse. And I know in the last generation that's a thing of the past, but I don't care. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you don't know how to shoe a horse, then I just think that's wrong. So shoe a horse. Don't go to an eight-week school. Go to your horseshoe or somebody you know or that knows how to shoe one and learn how to do it. All you got to do is put, you know, nail a shoe on. I mean, that's... It's pretty simple. It's not like you're, it's high tech. So learn it. Now this lady, Barb, she got a hold of me and she was asking a couple questions and that's the reason I'm sitting here on this chair so I can um, focus on what I'm telling her without working a horse at the same time. So I'm gonna quote a couple things she asked. And one of them was, can I put a Makate on a she got a snaffle bit from us and wanted to know if she could put a Makate on instead of split reins. Yes, you can. In fact, there's more Makates on them than there is anything else, I think. It's a matter of choice for the human of what they're doing and what they want, as far as I'm concerned. And I've noticed most people that use split reins use pretty heavy reins, like a Rainer. I use the ones I use because they're 30 bucks at the tractor store. Real traditional deal. The other thing that was really brought me to this chair was um, a statement she asked me about when I talk about making a bridal horse. She said, my second question was in conversation about watching the progression of Chinaco. That's my colt. Did I hear you correctly that you would ride him in the bosal and go from there to the bit and not use a snaffle? finish off that she says I have maybe I may have misheard what you were saying our understanding is that it's the snaffle to the bosal to the bridle okay well here's one there everybody's right I've, I've talked about this before and I hate to be redundant but I personally to make a bridle horse spade bit horse a I wanted an Iberian horse so I've got one B, I will ride 
in a halter. Then I will progress to a 5 8 bosal, and that will be in the longest. Then I will go to a half inch, and I will work my way to a two rein. And my colt will never see a snaffle bit of any kind. All right, that's one way of making a spade bit horse. And if Martin Black was sitting here, you would hear a different story. If Bruce Sanford was here. And there's a whole bunch of guys out there that make really nice horses that are really hell of a lot better hands than I am, but they're not gonna tell you anything because they're, they're just doing what they do out in the brush. So um, what am I getting at is I've mentioned it before, you get four rangemen, you're gonna get four stories. So that's my story. And, and the way I pursue it is I pursue the bridle horse by the fact of the mission days, the days of the, the dons and the, and the big outfits and the grizzly bears and how hair triggered the horses were. Well, how they went about it, I'm not sure. And, and I don't know that anybody's really sure how they did it, but I try to emulate the handiness of that horse with the least amount of effort. That's what I want to do. And that's why I am i don't use the snaffle. Now, a whole lot of people, I think and what, where one of the gaps is in our conversations with all these videos is that there's a confusion. And what I've noticed is that a whole lot of stories that come to me about horses, they're older horses. They're 8, 9, 10, 11. And some people say my 12-year-old horse, I think, is ready for a half-breed. Well, yeah, I would think so. This whole thing about the Western bit, if you own the horse as a colt, by the time it's five, you should be in a, in a Western bit. I'm not gonna say a spade, I'm not gonna say a half breed, I'm gonna say a Western bit. Okay, so now you've gone up until 12 and you think they're ready. Well, they, they really should be ready. So th what I do is if I have a horse that I've been riding in a, Snaffle bit, or say I get a horse in that's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and it was riding a snaffle bit up till then, and I'm going to transition it. And if you're going to transition to a half breed or a spade, the simple way is, is if you can ride one-handed and do lateral work, which is sideways, with one hand and not move your hand, then you're ready for a Western bit. It's not a religious experience and it's nothing to do with the mission days. It's just you put the Western bit on and a Western bit to me, as you know, is a half breed, a port, solid mouth, shank, loose shank, cheek piece bit. I'll only mention it once. It has nothing to do with the correction bit. That's a whole different story that has nothing to do with me and or my discipline. So I hope that I can clear some of this up and I will give you a little background from the way I see it and the way I want to make a spade bit horse in the in the in the progression from snaffle to bosal to bridle. I think that came about in two phases. The closest you can relate to is in the horse show world they have snaffle bit futurities. Okay. And I've never heard of a hackamore futurity. So the hackamore is something that was put in there. And I think it was because of the West Coast people pressuring the AQHA to keep that in as a tradition. So if you go to the warm up pen just before a hackamore class and see how many horses are being warmed up in a snaffle, you'll kind of understand what I'm getting at here. And, and what the point is, is that there's no trainer in the world that's going to do what I'm doing. He'd starve to death. It takes me a long time, years, to get done what I want to get done. They don't do that. They ride a lot of horses. Well, I've got one colt standing over there. So it's, it's a different world, a different set of rules. So I think that's one of the places the snaffle to bosal to bridle thing came from. The other one is, is through the progression of history, in the days that I try to emulate, as far as my horsemanship goes, is that in the mission days, oxen pulled wooden wheeled carts the wheels were made out of oak and they'd load them up with hides or they'd load them up with the family and they'd go to the ocean and drop the hides off the cliff and put them on a ship or they'd go for a picnic or they'd go to a wedding and they would put all the family in these carts 
but oxen pulled them, okay? So 1769 is when the first mission was made in San Diego. You know me and my history. All right now, go over to the East Coast. And when they started with the settlements over there, first they had to build roads. So they were following game trails right off the coast and they turned them into horse trails and then they turned them into roads so they could haul freight. And then they fixed up the roads well enough that they could use horses and wagons. And then it turned into buggies. So there was a lot of, there was driving horses sooner on the East Coast than there was on the West Coast. Now stick with me on this. So in the evolution world, the snaffle bit was on the East Coast sooner than the West. All right, so now it evolved to coming around the horn and ended up over here and the, and the Yanks were jumping off the ships and joining the mission people and all that. And then I think that's how it came into being. Now, as far as a bridle horse goes, you really need to understand that there was several different generations of bridle horses. So when you have this conversation around the campfire or the fireside chat, as she so eloquently called it, First thing you gotta do is settle on your timeline because people like Arnold Rojas, when he wrote about it, and Ed Cannell, I, I got bothered about the Ed Cannell stories all the time because people were really quoting and going for it. But what they didn't understand and was explained to me by a lady in Winnemucca, Ed Cannell rode the horses of the day. And what she meant was that these were older, tougher horses and he wrote down what he knew how to do on a ranch and how he got it done. Well, we've evolved since then. He did what he needed to do back then and he wrote about it. Well, very few people ever wrote down about horsemanship. All they did was write about the Chisholm Trail and the Western shoot 'em up, rob the bank deal. So there wasn't a whole lot of instructional books out there and Ed Cannell happens to be one of the guys that made one. So there's another look at the bridle horse different from the way I see a spade bed horse. Then you had the breaking of the century in the 1900s, early 1900s, and then you had the guys that were the crossovers between the vaquero and the buckaroo. And they all worked together. And now you started mixing things up on how to make a spade bit horse and how you did this and how you did that. So there's different generations. So I guess you understand my point is that today the reality is that all kinds of people have older horses that are eight through on up, and now they're transitioning to a Western bit. Well, that's nothing to do with what I'm doing from the mission days. But what I do is share with you what I know is knowledgeable wise is riding by transitioning a horse from my bit right here to a Western bit, because I found out that I can take a solid mouth bit with a cricket in it, and I can take a horse that's been in a broken mouth snaffle, cold jawed, and I mean dead sided, and lighten them up with this bit because it's a new set of pressure, teach them the concept of release, and then put a Western bit on them and go on and really have a lot of fun. So this is a transitional bit from one phase to another. Now, if you choose to start a colt in this bit and don't use a broken mouth, you're going to be a step ahead of the game as far as I'm concerned, but now that's your choice. So I hope that clears some things up because of the age of the horses and the timeline. I have a, another question that people have asked a couple of times, um, not just recently, but throughout the past, is why not just stay in a bosal forever? Okay. Why not stay in a bosal forever? Well, I can, I can make it pretty simple. If you never get out of the arena or you never actually do anything, then you can stay in a bosal forever. But in the ranch world, which you understand that's where I'm from, I have been outrun by several people in my career with a horse running through a hackamore. And I mean leaving the country. So the things that come up when you're trying to make a hackamore horse on a ranch, it's really, really hard. I could never do a good job because your first job is the cow, not the horse. And what we, people of us that tried to ride in hackamores and do things right and everything, we found out that we got them dull pretty quick because we were having to go get that yearling that got breachy and went through the fence. We had to 
uh, drag calves. We had to work in the alleys. We had to do feedlots. We had to work a lot of cattle and fast. Why, I'll never know, but we had to get it done because of some phenomenal reason. We were in a hurry. Well, now I've got the time to take and I can do it correctly. So if you choose to not put a bit in your horse's mouth, well, that's your call. But you'll find that if you do a whole lot of actual ranch work, you're going to find out that you probably ought to have it. As far as I'm concerned, it's safer. And it's part of the evolution to the Western bit, which is the actual end of the story on Western riding. Same with the snaffle bit. And you, I've said it before that when you go to work on a ranch, they don't hand you horses that say, well, this is a spade bit horse and this is a half breed horse. They just hand you a string of horses. And that's why in the West, because that's where most of the big outfits are that give you a cavy, a lot of guys rode in a snaffle because they knew they could bend them. It's that simple. They, they just brought a snaffle with them. They had a bit for trade or use and lucky they'd luck out if they stayed in an outfit long enough they could transition them over to bridle and a lot of guys did because they took pride in what they're doing but the snaffle was the go-to to survive it not the bosal all right folks so i know this i hope i don't i don't make this worse make it more confusing but the point is most of the people that get a hold of us have horses that are older and they're trying to fix problems okay my go-to answer on almost every one of them is rope them Okay, that means they have manners on the ground. You get a lot of things taken care of. The other one is, as far as riding goes, you get to make a choice on how you actually want to ride and what you want to put in a horse's mouth. I can help you by seeing a picture of your horse or listening to your story. And some of you, you notice I have you call me because it's specific things I need to talk to you about. But back to the term of snaffle to bosal to bridle, there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's just one of the ways of making a bridle horse. So enjoy it and uh, good luck. I mean it. And for all you young people, once again out there, it's really special for me to get to talk to somebody that has a brain that's young. And it's it's pretty darn nice. And I'll help, them, help you any way I possibly can. So keep them cards and letters coming. Thank you. Adios que vaya bien.